and we're recording. Hello, everyone. Today I'm joined by John Williams from Antinatalist Advocacy, but you're not representing the organization today. You're in your private capacity to talk about uh, antinatalist donating sperm. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. Um, Do you want to just give an intro to who you are for the audience? Sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Mark. Um, so yeah, John obviously set up Antinatalist Advocacy, a very small voluntary project that I'm running with Lawrence Anton, obviously you know from his YouTube channel. Um, yeah, been an antinatalist, or his card-carrying antinatalist now for about four years, I guess. Um, set up Antinatalist Advocacy to form something of a platform or to start conversations around doing good, because I do believe that antinatalism and antinatalists uh, have an interesting perspective that can be used in, you know, conversations about existing kind of social issues. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's a bit about me and how I got to this kind of space. Um, in terms of like representing myself, obviously it's just me and Lawrence running antinatalist advocacy. So it's really just me saying it's me and not Lawrence. <laughs> okay. I do think though, in general, uh, depending on where antinatalist advocacy goes, it probably is good to distinguish between personal and kind of like organization positions if that makes sense so i don't for example like the company you work for will not necessarily have a position on a particular social issue um, but then you might have strong views on it and so it's a similar thing here uh, these particular comments around sperm donation they're my own if that makes sense yeah thank you um so for people wondering how we're going to frame this we're going to focus on not necessarily like the empirical data or the science behind gene selection and stuff like that. It, what we're gonna do is like grant the caveats because the point of contention is whether or not this is permissible utter antinatalism. You'll yes. assert that it is, I'm gonna assert that it's not. And so we'll grant the caveats uh, and um, go from there. But, but the focus isn't to like uh, talk about difference in normative theory difference in like the ancillary conversation but just like on this specific uh um, what is or isn't under permissible under antinatalism kind of thing yes definitely and i do uh and and maybe some of the replies to my comments maybe got to this which is totally fine um but as you said about normative theory if this bottoms down to deontology versus consequentialism which it might do um it might be good to get that out of the way early because we're probably not going to uh, solve that debate that has been going for probably yeah, thousands exactly. of years by now on this live stream. Say so which one is the true moral theory? <laughs> so um, I'll play the original clip uh, uh, from your podcast. Right. In the podcast, you start off with um, it's like you're like it's you moving forward, right? So is Lawrence not part of the podcast anymore, or? Oh, we we just have different roles. Uh, okay. Lawrence was most heavily involved in the, uh, like the setup of the conference last year, which was a really big undertaking. Bear in okay. mind that obviously, you know, we both got nine to fives, and Lawrence has got his YouTube channel as well. So we decided that he would take that project forward, and then I would bring on podcast guests, okay. gotcha. and pump out episodes. Okay. All um... right. Just to say, with this particular podcast episode, so we have different cause areas, antinatalist advocacy, and even maybe the term cause areas might be a bit misleading because really these are like existing social issues where we think that antinatalists can have um, a particular, particularly important contribution. Um, and one of these particular cause areas is the problem of wild animal suffering. So we got on Humane Hancock, uh, Jack, he's like a animal activist. He's got a YouTube channel and has like interviewed Peter Singer, and he's done lots of street outreach and that kind of thing. But he definitely focuses quite a lot now on wild animal suffering. So we wanted to bring someone on to talk about, you know, what wild animal suffering is and why it's an important social issue. Okay, uh, go right into it. Great. Okay. Yeah, did you talk? Yes. About more, like more changing this kind of culture that could have a better long-term effect. Can you hear it? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. 
but I do think there's something to be said for like less people coming to existence is going to mean like less factory farming. Yes, this is true. And I do think this is something that we have to factor in. And there's something that's really hard to measure is like the meme of veganism or like the spreading of ideas, mm. um, which obviously does happen if you if you, you know, try to actively spread the ideas of veganism rather than just having fewer, advocating fewer people. Mm. Um, it's It's tough. Morality is tough, guys. This mm. is something that we've said on this podcast, <laughs> podcast before. It is difficult to do the right thing, and especially when wild animal suffering gets involved. Like I was definitely, as you were saying, uh, going down the and like the misanthropic kind of path of why humans here were doing such awful things. And then I found out about wild animal suffering and say, "Oh, humans need to stay here." But I think it's a bad idea to create them. So it's it's a tough thing. Um, but what we will say, and something that we have talked about before, is that yeah. If you do want to do good in the world, there are things other than having children that uh, uh, you can do. And you can also, you, know, you don't need to be in conflict with your ethics. You know, you don't need to have kids and tell them, I think it's a bad idea to bring sentience into the world. But just so you know, I really want you to go out and trash the environment, you know, just like, <laughs> just like burn grass and never let it regrow and um, build car parks wherever you go. So you'll bring the number of wild animals down. Um there are other things you can do to be impactful. Although I do think, and maybe this is a subject for another day, I do think that so long as, if you're an anti-natalist, you know, so long as it doesn't increase the overall amount of human births, which might go against anti-natalist ethics, donating to a sperm bank to pass on your your good, wholesome anti-natalist genes, it might not be such a bad thing to do. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like... I can see an ethical if, argument for it. <laughs> yeah, if, like, you know, there's a couple who are going to have children anyway, it is so funny like <laughs> where philosophy could take you like you're like this <laughs> anti-natalist podcast and you're like genuinely like you're genuinely saying like yeah but i do think that you know if you're not gonna have your own kids but like you, you could go to a sperm bank and start exactly donating because of your you, you know it wouldn't it wouldn't conflict with most people's versions of anti-natalism if they weren't causing the number of people born to right. exist you know yeah. they might just get the sperm of some guy who's not a compassionate person so yeah i think that you know if you think you've got good genes overall um you, if you're an antinatalist, you've probably got like higher empathy and compassion than the <laughs> person. So like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've said before that, you know, I went bald when I was 22 and I'm useless at all sports. So I don't think that people are going to want to inherit my genes if they, if they saw that on the, in the form. Um, so there's probably other reasons why people might not want my sperm at a sperm bank. You know, if you're, if you're a good looking guy and you're a nice dude, you should go you can consider it. Um, sorry, away from sperm and back to wild animal suffering. <laughs> um, and I'll show the comment that I made when I heard this and then your reply. Great. Um, okay, so I said, uh, maybe I'm just tired and misheard or misunderstood, but did John say as long as it doesn't increase the overall amount of human births, antinatalists donating to a sperm bank might not be such a bad thing to do and something for ANs to consider doing, question mark. And then you replied, John, hi, Mark, you heard correctly with several big caveats. One argument made against antinatalism is that if all the compassionate people stop having children, then they wouldn't be able to pass on the genes that may contribute to people being compassionate. This was part of the con uh, concern raised by Peter Singer in episode four of our podcast. I'll leave a link to all this stuff too in the description. Um, uh, I believe that if it is true that compassion is partly inherited, and uh, if it is true that antinatalists are more compassionate, and if donating to sperm banks does not increase the amount of procreation occurring, but rather leading to people being created who are more compassionate than the alternative, then someone concerned about this would do better to donate to sperm banks than having their own children uh, to pass on their compassionate genes. Just so you know, this is not something that I, John, will personally be doing. What are your thoughts on this argument? And then I responded with, uh, thank you for your reply and clarification. My initial thoughts are that I don't consider this antinatalism. It's a form of eugenics and a type of selective replacement uh, pro-mortalism or natalism. 
Sorry, pro-mortalism uh, or pro-natalism, sorry. Oh, pro-natalism. Uh, did I say pro-mortalism? Yes. <laughs> Um, selective replacement pro-natalism or natalism, uh, in my opinion. If you have any further thoughts, if I have any further thoughts, I will let you know, though. Right. Okay. I can stop sharing. So. Oh, no, if we can go up to the caveat, sorry. There was another oh. one. Uh, uh, here? A comment posted afterwards. No, at the, very, at the top, sorry. Should be the pinned comment on that. Oh, okay. Okay, amend. Great. Ad addendum. Yes, the addendum. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I can read this out if you want. Sure, to. go ahead. Um, so yeah, just at the, I brought up this comment afterwards um, and posted it and posted in the description as well. At fifty six twenty, myself and Jack, who's obviously Humane Hancock, the guest, discussed the topic of antinatalists making sperm donations. I later provided some important caveats and reiterated others in the YouTube comment section, which you can find below. I would like to reiterate that, as stated in the comment section, whilst I see the logic behind the actions discussed being permissible under consequentialism, with the important caveats I mentioned, I do not advocate sperm donation as a form of activism. This discussion was inappropriate for the forum of the Antinatalist Advocacy Podcast, as the opinions expressed were my own and do not reflect the position of antinatalist advocacy or the views of my fellow co-founder, Lawrence. I would therefore like to apologise for any confusion caused. So yeah, would you like me to comment on, well, my comments? Um, there was also something in the description, or was that just a copy-paste of the... I think it's a straight copy and paste of the okay. addendum. Okay. Great. Uh... So yeah, I think, I've, just in reflection, after two months, um, I think the content of what I said still stands. Would I have said it in that way? Probably not. Yeah, I was going to um, ask, like, did you, did you want to like rewords or like roll back any of the... Like if you were to rephrase it kind of thing. Um, I think maybe the forum wouldn't be appropriate because again, it's like an antinatalist advocacy podcast. Um Jack is someone who I've, you know, known before. And uh we actually mentioned this in the video. We actually know someone who donates sperm supposedly for value spreading. Um, so maybe this is a topic it's a topic that we talked about before. Um, and again, you can tell from like the way that we're laughing and joking about it that maybe we weren't treating this topic with the seriousness that it deserved. Um, you know, around th there is something funny about the thought of a bunch of antinatalists going to a sperm bank and jacking it to save the future. That is just a funny thought. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think, I think the way that the way that the conversation or the way that the sperm donations, uh, the way that I've discussed it in the past was specifically as a response to people. Uh, and there are people who take this seriously. And, you know, when people talk about, you know, what makes someone stand out and do good, is it because of, you know, is it memes or genes, if that makes sense? And people are a complicated mix of both. And understandably, for historical reasons, people are very worried about talking about genes. But there are people who I do respect um, who at least entertain the consideration that, uh, people's behavior in terms of their moral behavior may have a genetic component. And then people have used, well, Peter Singer said it, um, Magnus Vending has mentioned it in the book as well. Again, I think not even in a hard way of like, you know, they're not saying that it's mostly inherited or even definitely inherited, but there are people who take it seriously. And I think it's a big unknown. And then as it says in the follow up that I've always brought this up before as a, a counter argument to someone who says, um, antinatalism is a bad idea because if there are those genetic components that relate to compassion, then antinatalism might cause them to go extinct or whatever. And my point is like, well, if it doesn't actually lead to any further procreation and you really are concerned about this, I think it'd be a lot more ethical to donate sperm so that there is no additional procreation rather than having kids your you know, having kids yourself and increasing the number of beings being brought into existence. Um in terms of the follow-up, I guess the apology was more, if anything, it was more of an apology to Lawrence, like the addendum, because... Oh, uh, like you didn't want, like, splash splash damage on, like, Lawrence and... Yeah, I think this is when the uh, response, you know, that it was getting quite a lot of backlash and... Was it? I, f I felt like it was, like, three people. I had, yeah, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to pick out individuals, especially as we, they're not here to reply, but... Fair enough, yeah. um, I saw people saying that... You know, I'd come and saying that I should go out and apologize and tell people I've changed my mind. And I thought, well, I haven't done. I haven't really seen that many arguments, which we'll get to later. Um, 
you know, people saying that this uh, is an anti-natalism and then people, I was worried that this would kind of like fall back on Lawrence, if that makes sense. This was like, I think there's an element, especially if you're trying to represent a group or an organization, there's an element to like picking your battles. Right. And I do think that sperm donation is not something that it's worth dying on your sword over, especially in my case, if you don't think that it, you know, it's not a good form of activism to pursue, even if those caveats hold, I think there are other reasons for not doing it. And also some other reasons for doing it, but we can get to that later. Um, but either way, it's, it's not something that I'm out there advocating. Um, again, it's not something I'm going to do myself. So there's an element of like, is this the right, uh, is this the right battle to fight? But at the same time, I do think that it has raised some interesting questions for me in terms of how people respond to anti, you know, how people view antinatalism and how we respond to disagreement over that within the antinatalist community, which I'm sure we'll get to. Yeah. Um, so should we like go over our definitions of antinatalism? Well, I was thinking, Mark, what about your kind of uh, response to? those comments because it's my understanding that um like the motivation for donating sperm is unimportant in the sense of it would always be wrong if that makes sense if, if i'm understanding you correctly so there are other reasons for donating sperm that have nothing to do with value spreading you could be donating sperm to reduce suffering which is something that uh, one of the comments was going to pull up from nomad of omelas who's like a comments on lawrence's videos a lot he brought up the the reducing suffering argument for donating sperm um you could just donate sperm because i'm no you're getting paid to you know uh really entertain yourself for five minutes and then uh something you enjoy doing like it doesn't have to be for the value spreading points which i understand has more baggage related to you know concerns about eugenics and ideal people and this kind of thing but as far as I'm concerned, and most of the people who were responding were saying it wasn't to do with that. It's to do with the idea of donating sperm in general rather than your intentions of doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's more where I'm like for me when I said eugenics, it wasn't like some because, yeah, Pierce talks about it like multiple people talk about that. Kind yes, of thing. it was. But it's more in the, the context of this would be selective natalism. So that was more of like where I was uh, coming at the disagreement was uh, donating sperm would be the causal mechanism of like procreation, which would be uh, not permissible under antinatalism, not necessarily like the eugenics. Yes. Yeah. And that would apply even if you were donating sperm because you enjoyed it or yeah. because you wanted to reduce suffering through uh, the nomad of ominous argument that you're Do you want to bring up uh, Nomad's comment? Or I could try to uh, find Yes, I can put it in the. Okay, yeah. If you uh, just put the link, I can bring yeah, it up. I'll just put the link in the chat. Uh, so it's under one of uh, one of Lawrence's live streams. Okay, I should be able to bring it up. Perfect. Um, yes, recall... if you keep scrolling down, sorry, just there. Oh, the same. Um, yeah. So what happened is Lawrence was asked in the live stream, pardon me, Lawrence was asked in the live stream about uh, donating sperm banks. He said he's not in favor of it. And then Nomad of Omelas replied, can you elaborate on why the consequentialist conclusion regarding parents that are going to use sperm banks using better quality sperm and positively affecting the quality of life that will exist in expectation does not imply that sperm donations are ethically okay, if not a moral obligation. Is there a robust convo uh, on this that lists out the reason that this idea is not based in reality? As I might have missed it, and it could be quite, uh, uh, would be quite curious. Allowing beings who will exist to have worse quality of life than others than uh, other beings that could exist and have a better quality of life seems like a very non-antinatalist take. Often I worry that people see their ethical framework as antinatalism and sort of don't do anything that seems to support procreation 
Whereas antinatalism should be more soundly be thought of as a conclusion based on given normative ethic fra- uh, normative ethical framework. Please elaborate on this, as it seems to be a very com- confident comment off the cuff. So Lawrence essentially said, "I'm not going to go into it now, but I don't think it's ethical." Something like that. Okay. Do, do you want me to show the his? No, no. It, it was it was a very kind of. I think his comment just said. Um, I'll uh, show. Yeah. Sure, you haven't got the full context here. There is a section from the live where there's discussed more, but I've removed it as I do not wish to give any fuel to drama surrounding this. So I think this is around the time that okay. people are responding. But I think that so this is another argument for donating to sperm banks from a reducing suffering perspective that doesn't have anything to do with value spreading. It's the idea that you're providing um parents with more options to select for traits that tend to correlate with uh reduced suffering, if that makes sense. Yeah, so like under a, like, I'm confused by um, allowing beings who will exist for his quality of lives, uh, uh, life that would, oh my God, I can't read. Allowing beings who will exist to have worse quality of life than other being that could exist and have better quality of life seems like a non antinatalist take. Yes. So the idea being that if you go and donate, you are in expectation of increasing the likelihood that the parents will select with traits that correspond with less suffering, if that makes sense. So the more options that are available to the parents, um, the more likelihood that they will select. You're giving them more choice to select for traits that uh, correlate with less suffering. And his point is a bit like mine in the sense of the being is going to come into existence anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, there could be this other you know that's so it's it's not as if you going and donating is increasing the number of beings coming into existence it's more that um there will be this other positive benefit um and the number of beings that come into existence will be the same okay um cuz yeah like i i just uh to me if you make the if you grant that it would reduce suffering mm um, then you just justified procreation in my view. How so? Because, uh, like hypothetically, if I said, like, if we take out the, the sperm clinic, uh, and you just go like private, right. Mm. And, uh, someone's like, I'm determined to have kids and, um, whether or not you donate this sperm for the individual, I'm going to go, I'm going to go procreate anyway. Yes. Uh, but if you do donate, I'll give you some money um, that's cheaper than using the organizations. And you could use that money to, one, donate your antinatalist genes, and then two, use that money to donate to effective cause er- charities. Mm. Would that be permissible under antinatalism? So I want to take the, ant- could I take the antinatalist genes part out of it because I worry that that carries with it extra baggage when okay. the real um, contention is that around donating sperm in general. Okay. I, I do agree that the, the the money being donated to charities is a good point. So I don't know if people do actually get paid for sperm donation, but hypothetically, you well, I meant raise privately. Money. Like if someone didn't want to go through a clinic, and yes, like, like a friend of yours. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and in fact, I do think this is what happens with Jack's friend, Humane Hancock's friend, who donates sperm. But anyway, I actually know um, people like that too. <laughs> yes, yeah. so they're getting paid to donate sperm privately, uh, and. In this hypothetical, are any more beings coming into existence? Um, well, the, the person's going to... Okay, so from the story that I've heard... Actually, I think I, I heard this on the news as well. Um, so if the person does not donate the sperm, yes. the being will be created anyway. Like yes. a, or, or a, a being. A being, yes. Yeah. It won't be the same one, but a be being same, will be created anyway, right. yes. Yeah. Uh, I think that is fine in, in, in with those caveats that no more additional beings are being cr- brought into existence i think that's perfectly fine under antinatalism and the reason is is because through our actions we change the beings of who we change the identity of beings who are being brought into existence all the time through our actions so this would just be another case of doing that yeah did you want to talk about more about the identity uh about yes the- stuff okay so this is something that kind of blew my mind um when i found out about it because i used to think in this kind of hypothetical if you change the uh 
the identity of the being that's coming into existence. It felt a bit like the classic train track problem, or not even a problem, but you know, where two people are tied to a train track, one on each side, and the train is hurtling towards one. And then by you changing the identity of the being that's being brought into existence, it's a bit like you're pulling the lever and the train goes and hits them. So I thought that, you know, the actions that you're doing to change the identity of beings, um, yeah, that they're really wrong. Uh, the only problem with, and I'm not saying that it isn't wrong, but the problem is, is that we change the identity of beings that come into existence all the time. And this is something that's uh, laid out in an article by Will McCaskill called uh, The Moral Case Against Ever Leaving the House. And he doesn't say this um, because he believes that believes in this moral case um, against ever leaving the house, as in that's his conclusion. But he says his argument is that from a, a deontological uh, perspective, you've got a strong argument for never leaving the house because you are changing the identity of these beings and violating their rights. And the way it works is this, um, by interacting with people, by, uh, and we can, I've, I've linked the article in the chat, mate. Can we link that below this video? Yeah, I'll, I'll, all the links you've shared, um, I'm going to put in the description for people to follow up. Perfect. So his argument is that by going out and interacting with the world, say you get in the shopping queue at the grocery store, um, you call up someone, uh, you know, you get put on a, on a waiting list because, you know, you're the third in the queue on a, on a phone call. Um, by interacting with the world, you are affecting the schedules of people. Um, it's unavoidable. Like, you know, if you, you just have, you know, the bus leaves one second later because you were getting on the bus and therefore you've affected everyone's schedule on that bus by one second. And that just happens by when we, you know, when we interact with the world, um, which prim primarily when we leave the house, but would also inclu include things like being on the phone to people. Um, and the reason that's important for changing people's identities is because you change, you affect people's schedules, they go and affect people's schedules. And then there's this cascading effect whereby uh, you affect someone's schedule to the point of a conception event. So by changing their schedules and they slightly um, change someone else's schedules and so on and so forth. And um, you'll end up that a different sperm will hit the egg than otherwise would have happened. So you've changed the identity of the person that comes into existence. Um, and that different child that you brought into existence will now impact, to, to pick the wording from the article, that different child will now impact all sorts of things as they go about their life, including future contraception events. And then those new people will impact further future contraception events and so on. So thanks to these uh, ripple effects, after 100 or maybe 200 years, basically everybody alive will be a different person because you went to the movies. So they're using this example of you going out to the cinema, affecting people's uh, schedules, and then it cascades. And it's a really uh, strange thing to get your head around, the thought that because you went to the grocery store, um, everyone will be a different identity than they otherwise would have been in a few hundred years. But it does really appear to be the case. So unless we're going to hold that, we must avoid uh, actions that change the identities of people, such as leaving your house and, again, going to the cinema or whatever. Um, it feels like the sperm donation example both in, you know, practically, when, well, the, the hypothetical that you gave, Mark, if we focus on that, it feels like the same thing is happening where all you are doing, well, the, the practical consequence of what you are doing is that the identity of that person um, has been, uh, the identity of the person who was going to come into existence was changed. And that same would happen if you didn't donate sperm, but instead you went for, you know, you went to the cinema or you went to the grocery store you would have affected people's schedules and changed the identity of those people uh, of the some future person as a result so from your perspective donating sperm has a similar outcome as going to the cinema uh, in the sense of changing the identity of future people who like well, changing the identity of the future people who come into existence yes okay um so then what would differentiate between that and normal procreation just the addition of the yes like an additional person you're bringing additional people into existence and i think that's wrong um 
because in the hypothetical example, um, the, the sperm donation example, so you don't donate your sperm and the other person does and then one person comes into existence. Whereas if you went and had a kid separately, presumably this other person would have you know, continued on their procreation and then two people would have been brought into existence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... So what I'm interested, and this is something that I've struggled a bit with in the reaction to these comments, I'm really trying to understand with all the caveats that were laid out, not just in the comments, but in the original audio as well, that no additional people are coming into existence. I'm really struggling to understand how, from a consequentialist perspective, which was how it was set up, uh, this violates antinatalism. It's going to be hard for me to answer for other people because <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't, like I saw people comment, but I didn't really like, like I don't know their worldview. Um, That's fine. Uh, I could give like, for me, this is just like a category issue. Um, you, like, so for me, I would be like, um, this is a permissible act under consequentialism as a replacement procreative act. But uh, if it's a replacement procreative act, then like, it's just a different category. That's all. So would going to the cinema be a replacement procreative act? I would not think that, no. I would think that there's a difference between um, donating, do not just donating sperm. Like let's, like, let's say it's like someone just privately asks me, I want to procreate. Um, and if you say no, I'm going to go procreate with someone else. Uh, and... I'm like, well, consequentially, the outcome is the same, right? I'm someone not sure it is in that example because there's someone else who, like, you are not going to procreate. You're an antinatalist. So if you say, oh, sorry, no, I meant like a being would be, like, the outcome is yes. um, uh, a being would be created. Um, so, like, that, that's going to happen regardless if I um, participate or not, right? So, just, just in this hypothetical example, yeah. one child is going to be made. And this person's like, it's either your sperm or somebody else's. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah, the, that's that is sperm donation essentially, isn't it? You're yeah, not yeah. making you're not making the choice to procreate. I mean, in this case, and I don't want to get too graphic, but you might be the one playing, you know, hide the sausage or however people want to term it. But again, I don't see any difference fundamentally. It's your sperm that's being used to create the person, but the the consequence is that the identity is different of the being that came into existence but you would have you would change the identity of beings that come into existence all the time anyway right um but in terms of like I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around like going for my morning coffee which i understand will change people's identities to having sex with someone like i don't see that as symmetrical i mean you know, we can get into signaling points. Uh, you know, the signaling is in like, you know, would it confuse people if they saw antinatalists donating sperm and bonking and inseminating people? I get that, but one, you know, no one knows who antinatalists are. Like, like antinatalists being seen to engage in procreative acts, would that confuse? I get that, but from a purely consequentialist perspective, mm -hmm. I the, the difference. Yeah, you going for your morning coffee changes the identity of people that come into existence. And I don't think that's, it seems like way too much of a burden to say to people, never leave the house, never interact with people because you're going to be changing people's identities. I mean, that that would surely, if, if we held that as our moral position, then that would, uh, you know, tie into lots of stereotypes about antinatalists being terminally online losers who don't live in the real world. And we don't want to be doing that. Um, um and so, I, I do. Oh, sorry, 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 I do totally sympathise. It feels different in terms of you know, you know, going for your morning coffee and impregnating someone. But if you, if in the hypothetical that you created, um, the outcome is the same, in the sense of a being comes into existence. I don't see how they're different from an antinatalist perspective. If we to, if morally we to... relevantly different, I should say. Sorry, morally relevantly different. If we were to like use something, uh, another ethical um, domain out, outside mm. of like procreation, uh, let's say 
I don't know, someone's inevitably going to use slaves or they're going to use, uh, like, they're going to uh, kill someone, stuff like that. Like, if yes. I use a replacement argument under those cases, would it also cash out kind of thing? Yeah, so this was actually put to me. Someone said, if a vegan said, I'm going to go and work in a slaughterhouse so that I can slaughter the animals more humanely, um, they're going to be slaughtered anyway. I'll slaughter them more humanely, and the amount of animals being killed won't change, but the amount of suffering that they experience will go down. Would that still would that be vegan? They said, like, would that be vegan? And I said, yeah, I think it'll be a stupid thing to do in this case because, you know, you'll traumatize yourself working in a slaughterhouse, or there are other alternatives that you can do. You can go and get a high paying job and donate money, or, you know, it's not worth you doing putting yourself in that dangerous situation but i wouldn't say that conflicts with vegan ethics mm. now there is a difference in the case of vegans though to be fair because the people know who vegans are and they know what they stand for at least in the west so um there might be some signaling issues where someone goes hang on that vegan's working at a slaughterhouse what's going on there we don't have that with antinatalism we Nobody knows who we are. We don't have behaviors that tie us all together or viewpoints that tie us all together that easily identify us. So if an antinatalist walks into a sperm bank tomorrow, no one's going to be the wiser. So it's not like some grand, they're going to be worried about some signaling point of, oh, we're going to give off a confusing message to what antinatalism is about. No one's going to know. Whereas people might know if you're a vegan and you work at a slaughterhouse, um, then people might be confused by that. If we were if we were a larger and more prominent community and we were joined by you know more easily identifiable, that might be the case, but I don't think it is mm. currently. So I think so like all um acts that we would deem not okay could be justified as a replacement if done to re like it would be done in um a way that would be less suffering. Uh well I well you, you have to compare, you know. If the if the harm is going to occur, yeah, but the harm is the the you, you know the over I don't know if it's right with the overall harm because you're talking about different kind of harms here really. Mm -hmm. So you, especially I think the vegan example is a good one. It's a good analogy because yeah, a good one. you've got the harm from the killing, but there's this other harm from the suffering which might go down. So with the sperm donation example, if we use nomad of omelasses. Uh, argument you've got the harm from coming into existence but the harm from the experiencing life might go down if you know they've been selected for traits there so you've got this overall harm which is going to happen but you can still reduce some of it by you doing it instead now, again like it, it could in theory like you know someone's going to go and murder someone and they pay you to be a hitman and you kill them humanely now in practically, you're going to get yourself thrown in prison, and that might be a stupid thing to do. But you know, in this hypothetical, with all things held, all that's happened is that you've reduced some suffering in the world. The death has already happened, but you've reduced some suffering. Yeah. So, like, I'm I'm not coming at it from like the ethicality of it, but the category of it. Mm. So, if I say, um, here's an ethical theory that says it's wrong to kill a person, full stop. Yes. And then we say under uh, an outcome consequentialist view, um, as long as you're replacing um, to reduce the harm, uh, it would be permissible to, to do this act. Then the act category would be different, like the category of, of what it would be. So like, this is, this is the, more the killing would still be wrong. And in the sperm yeah. bank example, the, the bringing a being into existence is still wrong. It's just you're right. not morally responsible for it. Hmm. So, yeah, it's it's wrong to slaughter animals for food. It's wrong to bring beings into existence. Um, but you're not the one who's making that decision. Your involvement is reducing some harm in some way. Agreed. But that but that's like under the rubric of consequentialism, right? Yes. And then if... Which is all, how, how my comments are from day one have always been from consequentialist perspective. And... I could grant like under consequentialism definitely permissible, but then if we have like a um, an ethical conclusion that situates that you wouldn't like a person cannot kill or procreate, then I just feel like we're in a different category. Um, but uh, you're saying no, right? Well, again, from a consequentialist perspective, like you could have 
you know, you, you could make deontological arguments against this, um, which is fine, totally fine. But again, I don't really want to get down into deontology versus antinatalism. No, no, no. I think you can make the case that, you know, this sperm bank conclusion is so outrageous that uh, you can't be a consequentialist and an antinatalist. Then that's fine. That's that's not that's an argument for a separate day. I think it's based upon. We can divide the antinatalist even further if you want. You know, we're already a tiny community. Let's kick out all the consequentialists. Um, From my perspective, consequentialists outnumber the deontologists. By the way, I don't know if that's your perspective. I, I don't really know, but again, I've 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 seen people say that antinatalism is a non-conditional objection to procreation, which I think personally is a bit daft because if you remove the harm of coming into existence, then I don't think there's anything wrong of coming into existence. Yeah, so actually, can we um, can we go into like how you define antinatalism and how do you differentiate between antinatalism and not antinatalism? Sure. So I believe that it is wrong to bring sentient beings into existence. This is obviously based upon the world that we live in now. It doesn't mean that it will always be wrong to bring sentient beings into existence. And it also doesn't mean that bringing sentient beings into existence um, might not be the right correct thing to do if an even greater harm is um, averted. So let me walk through those we touched touched it briefly off that but to walk through those so what i mean is if we lived in a david pierce world the transhumanist world and david pierce is trying to remove all the harms of coming into existence if we live in that world i don't see anything wrong with bringing beings into existence if you remove the harms it just so happens that we live in a world where there is a ton of harm to coming into existence which is why i think it's a bad thing to do but if you remove all the harm from coming into existence i don't see why anyone would oppose it unless it's just for like purely aesthetic reasons or something. But you've removed all that harm, however you determine harm, then I don't see anything wrong with procreating or bringing beings into existence, sorry, because it could involve more than procreating. And then the second one about the trade-off. This is where, um, to pick a ridiculous example, um, you know, if someone said, if you don't bring an additional being into existence, I'm going to rerun the Holocaust and tens of millions of people are going to die. I think that would be... Uh, you know, in that horrible trade-off, that horrible tragic choice where you have to do something that you think is morally wrong in procreating, but to stop this gigantic harm over here, um, I think that would be fine. Like, I think that would be, it wouldn't necessarily be a, but I say not fine, fine is poorly worded. It might be the least bad of the two choices um, to procreate or to let the Holocaust happen, if that makes sense. So this is how I this is how I understand antinatalism. Um, you know, some people want to call that soft antinatalism because I'm not somebody who says that there is, um, you know, a hard rule against it. But then, if you're a consequentialist, if you scale up the consequences of not doing an action again, like the Holocaust example, to something ridiculous, then um, it might be the moral thing to do, the more moral thing to do, even if it is still harmful. Yeah, I was actually curious about your, like your wording when you said this might be a good thing because you said it, it wouldn't be obligatory, but it might be a good thing. Sorry, w w with what? Sorry, sperm donation. Um, well, again, if that's if you hold all of the caveats, so you've you've held the caveat that no, and this was talking specifically about uh, value spreading. So, if it is true, if the concerns that people have about values and genetic component, if they are true, and it is true that we antinatalists have some compassionate genes, like you can tell from my wording in the video that you know maybe I wasn't treating this as seriously as I should have done, or it was quite jovial because I said I think I used the phrase "good wholesome antinatalist genes." Yeah. I don't think there is literally a genetic trait that makes someone an antinatalist. I was talking more about the, you know, the concerns that people have related to compassion or acting ethically, however you want to frame it. So if it is really true, that's the case. And then no, um, being, being brought into existence, um, and there are no further beings being brought into existence. Um, I can see that being a good thing to do. The reason I don't do it is because I'm not sure that those caveats have been met and there are other reasons for not doing it. Okay. Um, Like it feels like a it, it it does feel like a big demand to place on someone to say you should go and donate your sperm. I don't know something about using putting a demand on someone to use their body in a certain way. It feels in that in that sort of way. 
something off about again this is not a thought that i've maybe thought about through uh nearly enough i'm sure people can come up with much better counter arguments but saying that sperm donation is morally obligatory feels iffy to me yeah i don't know how to offer like um a proper counter argument to the category um distinction between us um, i'm not sure if i understand the category distinction i have to say and i don't know like, if it's because i'm just thinking of it purely from a consequentialist perspective what the outcomes I, are i'm ju i'm just thinking like um uh here like antinatalism to me is like a conclusion from um an argument with uh other propositions that will be say descriptive of coming into existence like mm. uh it's a harm a serious harm um yeah. or it's um it's unconsensual and um there are certain things that will be uh like um ethically uh wrong to to get to the conclusion that it's wrong to create a being mm. uh, for a moral agent anyway from my perspective um and so i'm thinking of it as like Antinatalism is saying it's unethical to participate in, like, the, like to to procreate. Um, well, yeah, I think those two are different, though, because yeah. there is a difference between saying it's unethical to bring beings into existence and it's unethical to participate in beings being brought into existence. Right. Because um, arguably, by going for your coffee, by changing the identity of the person that comes into existence, arguably you are participating in quite a, a substantial way. It might not be very visible. It might not be the same as literally handing over a cup of your sperm. But the outcome is the I'm same. I'm going to look at my cup of coffee in a different way than <laughs> <Mars. laughs> Um so, so like I could see it being under the umbrella of consequentialism, but I can't see it being under the umbrella of antinatalism. It's Do you think like, there's a difference between antinatalism and consequentialism? Yeah, I think consequentialism and data, whatever theory that you have, can yes. lead to this conclusion. Yes, that, that yeah, sorry, that, that's what I didn't mean that they're literally the same thing, but I just don't you know if the two were like separate. Like you can, yeah, no, like, I think all them. ethical theories can lead to uh, antinatalism. Yes. I, yeah. Um. So, like, uh, it's just whether or not this is um, permissible under the antinatalism conclusion is where uh, I don't see it, but I see it as being under the rubric of consequentialism. But if your definition of antinatalism is you're not allowed to participate in procreation, that is a very different definition to, well, to mine and to many others, I suppose. Hmm. And, and, like, and I, I don't know if I would word it that way. It would be, it's wrong for a moral agent to create a moral patient into existence. Um, but you're not doing that any more than you are by going and getting your coffee. Like you are changing the identity of it. If, if we lived in a world where you could easily avoid changing the identity of future beings, I think this might be a different argument. That for me feels more like pulling the train, pulling the... Um, lever so the train runs over the other person so is the wrong maker uh the decision maker like if someone makes so like um if we take procreation versus identity uh like changing identity yes. is the symmetry breaker such that it's it depends upon the person the agent making the decision because once the person yes. makes the decision then um you're not you know like it's it's on yeah. them it's the moral decision. agent who's designed to bring a being into existence. I think it's wrong to bring sentient beings into existence. Mm. So this person is making that decision. Yeah. But then I'm facilitating them creating the being. No, well, you're not, though, because they in this hypothetical, they would do it anyway. They choose someone else's sperm or just... You're not facilitating it happening. It's going to happen, whether you're involved or not. Yeah. But if a wrong act is going to happen, and I could choose to be part of it, um, but you you are part. But the, the way that you're involved, unless there's something aesthetically, and and like some people, as part of their antinatalism, they say that it's not about the consequences. There is something wrong about your personal genetic material being passed over. So. 
the sperm donation, you're passing over your genetic material. Fine. I don't think those arguments stack up, but fair enough. People want to do that. They say it's it's yes, I know you're changing. They they concede that you're changing the identity of people when you go and get your morning cup of coffee, and that by you being involved in this uh by donating sperm, you have a similar outcome in that changing the identity of that person. Uh, but there is something specifically wrong about you donating your gametes or something like that, then fine. I think that's a that's a sufficient difference between you getting your coffee, or not a sufficient, but it is a significant difference, at least aesthetically, between you donate uh, you buying your coffee and you donating sperm. I don't think it's a morally relevant difference, but I can understand why some people might have an aversion to the sperm donation point. I just don't think it's justified. Um, wait, sorry, I I lost track. Was uh, what what would be like wrong with the gamete? Like you could understand it, but it would be wrong. What's the yes? No, I, I've seen arguments that um, being involved, you know, literally donating sperm, um, like people again. This seems to be the reaction. So the the comments that we've seen a lot of people like never donate sperm. Um, I know that uh, when Nomad of Omelas has made his arguments, I've seen his comments a few times talking about this. People said, no, nope, never, wrong in all circumstances. It's like an aversion to it. And I do get that, as at least aesthetically, it looks very different to go and donate your sperm but compared to going and buying coffee. Pardon? But outcome-wise, it would be the same. Yes. Okay. And therefore, I don't think that there is a moral distinction between the two. Mm. Okay. I'll have to think about that some more. Um, yeah, I don't have. Uh, I don't think I have anything. Maybe, maybe while we continue, I'll have more um, more comments on that. Mm. Um, so I'm just going over some of the points we want. You wanted to talk about definitional disagreements. Yes. Um, and you wanted me to talk about like why I pulled out of the panel discussion um you can do if you would like to the, the problem is that with the community posts gone i don't want to be to be in a game of like you know what did you say back then and you know getting a dispute like that i don't think that's really fair just, just quickly if helpful. you were curious because i don't think i i don't know if you know why um i, I just sure. felt like it was uh uh extra labor for like an organization that i don't even know like aligns with my values um that's Essentially, it, it just felt like uh, a lot of work, um, which I mean, I, I put in some, but not, you know, not not a lot. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't I don't even know how to quantify that. But um, I think Lenny and Conundrum did a pretty good job, I think. Yeah, um, that's fair enough. And there was something um, if we can link that as well, by the way, episode 10, uh, the criticisms panel with Lenny and Conundrum. Yeah, there, um, there were some things, some questions I had around uh, how we approach disagreement in the anti-natalist community yeah could we leave that a little bit later sure. i just want sure. to make sure um because you wanted to ask me a question about veganism being worse or uh, sperm donation being worse something like what, that what, yeah so this was a question but this this is related to the um the points of uh disagreement so i'm just i would be interested from your uh perspective about I, th um, I think the uh, well, do you want to ask me so like um and then sure so the audience knows what sure 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 so i so i was thinking about how we approach definitional disagreements with the anti-natalist community and just to say up front my approach to you know who gets their anti-natalist card who's allowed in the community is basically anyone who says they're an anti-natalist because um we're such a small community we don't have um behaviors that all align with each other like it'd be very strange if you came across an antinatalist who's out there actively procreating bringing additional uh you know procreating the old-fashioned way let's just say um but apart from that there are many people who don't have children or don't have any additional children who are not antinatalists so that doesn't define us and there are many people in the antinatalist community who choose to be animals and there are many who think that eating animals by bringing those beings into existence it's a huge violation of antinatalist ethics so we don't have behaviors that unite us in the way that say you know a catholic might cross themselves vegans will 
avoid certain foods or products and you can identify them. So we don't have similar behaviors and we don't appear to have similar beliefs, really, apart from something about uh, beings, come, something about bringing beings into existence, but then we can't agree which beings. Um, it's really just something like not having any additional children would be like the lowest common denominator that brings us together. Um, and the reason I say additional is obviously parents can become antinatalists later in life. So we don't, because we don't have things that unite us in terms of like shared, you know, lots of shared beliefs or shared actions. The only thing that I think unites us is the labels, the I identify as an anti, someone saying I identify as an antinatalist. Um, and that's why I think that we need to have, as a community, we need to have a respectful um, and quite charitable approach to disagreement because there doesn't seem to be much that we agree on as a community. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Right. Um, so to answer your question about like, which would be worse, I, I think it's the animal agriculture yes. stuff. So, sorry, yes. Just to just say that the reason that links to our attitude towards disagreement. So the question that I laid out before um, was what do you consider to be a bigger violation of antinatalist ethics? Choosing to donate sperm in a way that does not increase the number of beings being brought into existence, which is obviously the scenario that I gave in the podcast episode, or two, choosing to pay for hundreds, if not thousands, of additional beings to be brought into existence through animal agriculture, i.e. by being a non-vegan with the option to go vegan. And you're saying that the... Um, the, the choosing the, the the second one, the animal agriculture one, is a bigger violation of antinatalist ethics from your perspective. Um, I don't know if I would word it like bigger violation of anti. I would say that like it's a bigger harm. Like yes, uh, yeah. Because uh, because the like antinatalist ethics. Um, like I again, I just see antinatalist as like this is a conclusion. But like anyway, yeah. but yeah, like if you if it's like, what's the that's biggest um. Yeah, like I, I think that's like the biggest harm. Yeah. I guess I mean, yes, a bigger harm in how you understand antinatalism. Um, what would, yeah, what action would align worse with the conclusion, if that makes sense, rather than think of it in terms of antinatalist ethics? Um, not contribute, like not uh, paying someone to uh, create a being. So the, sorry, just to be clear, that's the, um, the animal agriculture point where you. Yeah. So like when I things. go to purchase a product, I'm paying someone yes. or paying a company to create a being to slaughtering. Like all yes. That. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Right. I I don't think that we should, however, um, say that if you're not a vegan or you're choosing not to be a vegan, that you can't be an antinatalist. I think that we should pay a welcoming space in our community for non-vegans because that appears to be most antinatalists as far as I can tell. Are not yeah, mo I think most, um, and like there's been a couple of, uh, I think two or three surveys that I know of that have done this already. And yeah, yeah. the majority from what I've remembered was uh, the majority are not vegan. Yes. Um, yeah. And I and I did a stupid poll in one of the Facebook groups. I think about 150 odd responses, and it was something like 27% vegan, and then another like 10% vegetarian, and then like 63% ate meat. And you would expect in a poll like that that more vegans would answer it, more vegans right. would come forward and say that's for me. So if anything, that's probably not representative. The proportion of vegans is probably a lot smaller. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because like, to answer if anybody like thinks about like the YouTube antinatalist sphere it's way different than say like other uh antinatalist uh mm. spaces because i think like the people making content tend to be <laughs> there's a lot of vegans mm. uh antinatalist but that doesn't mean that this space like broadly is yes mostly vegan um yeah yeah um and the, but yeah so i i don't think though even though i consider you know paying for animal agriculture to be a huge uh, harm and something that very much violates antinatalist ethics in a way that I don't think the sperm donation example does. I don't think that we should, you know, hound people out of the community or uh, I'm trying to think, make demands to say, oh, 
I'm so sorry, I've changed my mind, or I will renounce the antinatalist label, or whatever other response that I got to my comments. Um, because yeah, again, I, I don't think that we should. We're already such a small community that the, yeah, the, the, the dividing over this kind of stuff just seems a bit pointless to me. Yeah, I um, unfortunately, like I, I didn't. Uh, it's been, what's this? I've been like a month or two. Um, yes, and I didn't pay too much attention to the other commentary because, um, like in my head, I saw it as this is something that I don't categorize it. It is what it is. I'm moving on. Um, and for me, like I actually don't care if I'm an anti-natalist or not by label. I have mm -hmm. my set of ethical principles, and if it doesn't align, then fine. Like I don't, I don't win or lose anything with the label. You know what I mean? Um, so if 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 it is permissible, um, I'll be like, okay, well, that doesn't align with my values, and it that's fine. Like I don't. Uh, but but I get like as an anti nihilist community, you want to say like, well, what unifies us, um, and how do you handle that disagreement? Uh, Yeah, I guess what the thing I was getting at is like, how, like, how do you? So you say you weren't really paying attention to the response. Yeah, to because my like, some, I, I don't, I know you don't want to use names, but like, one person wrote a lot of paragraphs, uh, and I'm like, I'm not, like, I, 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 don't, I just don't think it was, um, like, I'm not going to tell you how to run your organization. Like, it's it's your thing. It's it's. I'm not going to tell you how to be an anti-natalist. Like, mm. I, we're we're two people on the internet that cross paths. You do you. I do me. <laughs> like, like yes. I'm. Um, the, yeah. I I just see like I know it's technically like people say the word community, but it's it's a bunch of like people on the internet just voicing their opinion. Um, and I mean, I don't. As you said, like there's so many people that have different ideas of what antinatalism is. Yes, so I'm not going to go out there and be like you're like sixty percent or whatever are all wrong, and I, I don't know. Like, I guess yes. I'm just not that emotionally invested in keeping the purity of the label. Uh, I think probably when I first started, maybe. Um, but this these many years into it, mm, I don't care. Um, yeah. No, that's fine. And, and don't worry, this, we're not unique for doing this as a community. I think um, I've called it labelism, where there's such a focus on the label. It does happen in like animal activist spaces where, you know, we agree on 95%. We all act in similar ways. And then someone has a pet and someone's like, that's not vegan. Someone says, yes, it is vegan. They're a rescue. And someone right. says, yeah. you're giving off the option. You might make people want a dog and go to a breeder. So, it's almost like fighting over the label, but it, with antinatalism, I think it's even more important about the label stuff. It's because the label is all we have. Mm. With other communities, there are more that unite them: shared actions, shared beliefs, whatever. But I think with antinatalism, it's just the label. Do you think? Because, um, like, when you said that this would wouldn't conflict with most people's versions of antinatalism, you meant like, uh, like outcome wise, not necessarily that people would agree with you, right? Because I think the majority would disagree with you but that in substance you think the outcome is like like there's no difference right well it's hard to tell because i saw so many arguments that weren't addressing the caveats that it just seemed to ignore the most important caveat that was there from the start which is that no additional being is being brought into existence so it's hard to say whether or not people agreed with my caveats as they were laid out and i don't feel like i've really said anything today either that's like new information it was it feels like it was pretty much all there in the sense of me too no yeah that's how i feel beings. too um so it's hard to yeah. say whether or not people were responding to it. unless there's this like emotional aversion to like this seems to be supporting procreation which is fine it's totally understandable but i don't think it's something it's not you know it's not logical it's not carefully thought out i understand that emotional aversion but again when that's it's not an argument you. When someone asked you about the vegan slaughtering animals, yes. what, when you, you gave your response, did they say, okay, I'll think about that more? Or like, what was the reaction? Um, I guess it's, I mean, their reaction was, I mean, it was, it was in a conversation. I don't want to go into too much detail because, you know, they're not here to defend themselves. But I think their reaction was, 
but we had other stuff to talk about. I think it was like in the, in the context of a longer conversation. Okay. It wasn't like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. It wasn't that kind of reaction. Mm. Well, there, there was a bit of an, oh my God, I can't believe you said that with my, in response to my sperm donation comments, which made me really think, have I said something that's like, you know, so, because the reaction was like, I'd said something that's so obviously stupid. Uh, like, how am I missing this? Um, you know, say say you've changed your mind and apologize this kind of thing and i was like hang on i'm not really seeing any arguments against the position that i gave maybe i gave the position badly and i could totally understand if there was a huge reaction against the genetic part because people were like oh this is your uh don't even risk going near the edge of eugenics territory this is a stupid thing to say i'd be like you know what? fair enough i, I can relate to that um i think yeah maybe that is a, a good position to have as a community is like don't say anything that could in any way lead to someone thinking that i don't know you're, you're heading towards eugenics but yeah i mean it's hard to in this space i mean david pierce gets that objection all the time he's talking about yeah. like reducing suffering in the world and designing beings so that they don't suffer and people are like you're a eugenicist and i think that's a little unfair because you say eugenics i think like Nazis sterilizing people and killing people with disabilities. And here's David Pierce trying to reduce suffering by making future beings suffer less. And he's called a eugenicist. I don't know. It feels a bit off to me. Like the, yeah. the and I'm, I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep that in mind because when I said the term, I was thinking the Pierce route. Um, so it may have and across... wrong. That's totally, totally fine. Like I, I shouldn't have said it. even me saying that, uh, uh, you might have good wholesome antinatalist genes. I totally get why someone would be like, that sounds eugenic. See, I'm really put off by that. That's bad. Don't say it. That's fine. But that didn't seem to be the majority response. The majority response seemed to be like, this is so clearly in conflict with antinatalism. How could you say something so stupid? Mm -hmm. And yet, when I've explored it with people, and with, again with you today, Mark, I'm like, what am I missing? Where's the yeah, no, I'm, I'm willing to grant, my argument? Uh, I'm willing to grant um, that this could be uh, like, um, per, like again, with all the big caveats, if yes. hypothetically that was met, like this is more in a hypothetical realm. What is the impermissibility uh, outcome wise? Yes. Um, and I don't see anything right now. And so like, I would just be like, yeah, I could, I could see an argument made for it. Uh, I just think, again, my my thing is that I just see it as a different category. Um, while the permissibility would be under consequentialism, I don't think that, uh, like, consequentialism can justify antinatalist conclusion, but the antinatalist conclusion is categorically a different thing. Like, if, if I say that it, it's permissible outcome-wise, mm. um, I just would say that this is a type of procreation, even if the decision-maker is someone else um, because uh, of like slaughtering animals, for example, is, is I, I forgot what I, I, I used two different hypotheticals, but mm -hmm. um, like the decision is already there. Like, so someone's a, a serial, serial killer and, and I'm like, okay, well, the, this is gonna happen. Um, but I would, this would be, again, hypothetically, this is not like practical thing. Um, mm. If the killer was replaced with a compassionate killer, then yes. this is a replacement uh, that reduces harm. Then I, I just yes. feel like we're doing we're doing something else uh, ethically. Then, uh, if if you have an ethical stance that murder is wrong and right. this murder is going to happen, and you also think that suffering is bad, and if you don't join in, you know this person's going to murder them by feeding them to piranhas. Or you can shoot them in the back of the head painlessly. Like the the murder is still wrong. It's just like you're not morally responsible for the murder. Again, we're talking purely in the hypothetical. Right, right. In reality, you'd get arrested and it'll be throwing your life away and all this kind of stuff. But in this hypothetical, how does that violate with the principle that murder is wrong? How does you uh, changing the you know donating sperm and the person's already made the decision to procreate? How does that violate the principle that procreation is wrong. Hmm. This is what I'm really struggling. This is again like, what am I missing? Because from the response and the mockery, you'd be like, oh, he's clearly missed 
this is such a stupid thing to say. How could he say something like that? And I'm just there thinking, tell me, tell me. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of um, wish we maybe ha had a person who would um, be more strident to push back. Uh, um, because I can't, like, I can't give you that answer. Um, and I don't know where they're coming from. Uh, I am interested in the category points that you're raising. I, 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 I think we've maybe done the consequentialist point to death, um, which I think has well, been really helpful. I'm interested in your particular objections so, to it. So for me, it's just like, because you said um, that last bit, uh, the murder is going to happen. Yes. You replace the murderer. How is that in conflict with the murdering? And I'm like, well, not, not in conflict with the murder. It's in conflict with the principle that murdering is wrong. There's this other, this is other thing that you care about morally, right. that you can positively influence. In the case, in this case, it's the suffering in the act of dying. Well, yeah, like if I say that um, something can override. Uh, like replacing the murderer because it would reduce suffering or that it would um, be less bad then that overriding principle um outweighs the the murder principle but i don't know what that overriding principle is well wouldn't it be like uh harm reduction well well, this is again this i think this maybe just gets into my version of antinatalism yes i care about harm i'm an antinatalist because i'm concerned about harm reduction right i'm concerned about the harms of coming into existence that's why i'm an antinatalist like if you but if i said sorry um no, if sorry. if uh if i said creating a being mm. into existence will have a long-term positive impact then all i did was justify procreation no well, this is the David Pierce. So again, we live in the David Pierce world. The harms from coming into existence have been all removed. Um, and there's now no harm at all to coming to, into existence. The parents really want to create someone and the kid isn't going to be harmed. Fine. I think that's fine. I'm not an antinatalist in that world. That's not the world that we live in. Maybe another thing for me to make clear is that I'm not a uh, straightforward utilitarian. I'm a negative utilitarian in the sense that... I think that we value should value suffering a lot more than we value pleasure. And I also don't think that pleasure, any amount of pleasure can outweigh true suffering. So, um, yeah, I don't think that in the case of procreation, the happiness of the parents can be outweighed by the, uh, the harm that that being will go through. But I meant like if, um, say no being was added and we're just yes. replacing, right? Yes. And the long-term effect was a reduction of suffering. Yes. Um, then I feel like I, I just justified natalism or I, I justified procreation under this context. So right. you, you're bringing a being into existence and suffering is reduced in the long term. Yeah. I mean, that could be, well, this is where you're trading off harms in this case. Right. Which, as I said before, would be the other... Uh, justification so for me procreation is as i said procreation is permissible in two cases the first if you reduce remove all the harm from procreation that's fine or two where that harm is outweighed and i don't think i don't even that this doesn't relate to the real world that we live in so um a lot of like the laws that we have and a lot of the moral norms that we have and including a lot of the rules the moral rules we have um, I think can be justified and most people do justify them based upon consequences. So there's maybe something, you know, we touched upon Rivka Weinberg earlier. She says she's against using people as a means to an end, but I think her view of procreation uses people as a means to an end. She wants to have a relationship with her kid and love it and all this kind of stuff. So she creates the kid. I think that's right. And I can, I can justify that as a consequentialist by saying that a, a society you know, moral norms that say you can use people for your ends create more suffering in the long run. Even if they're in this particular moment, it doesn't. Because normally people will find situations, like outside of antinatalism, people mm. will find reasons to procreate and reasons not to procreate. Yes. And I feel like uh, when we're talking about reasons that could justify procreation, 
then we're just doing something outside of antinealism. We're we're doing um yeah, a different type of thing. Well, I I do worry this is where we're getting into the consequential in versus deontology. So if you have a rule that it is always wrong to procreate or But I'm but I'm not saying like the wrong maker. Like I could I could grant it's correct that it's yeah. actually ethical to procreate. But now I feel like I'm not doing antenatal. I'm I'm, ju I'm just saying it's I'm justifying the the less wrong uh, natalism part. So e even if well, I granted no, no, because you could you can even still because the thing is you could be trading off harms. You could still do two actions, neither of which are correct. Say, right. say there's like a line here, but everything above is good, everything below is bad. Right. And in the in the example I gave of procreate or I'll rerun the Holocaust. You're, you're taking a bad action, the procreating, and you've made the decision that, okay, this is going to offset this huge harm over here. So it's the better choice to do. It doesn't make it ultimately right. It doesn't cry. It's, you know, it's often called a tragic choice in the literature where you have to do something unethical to prevent something that's even more unethical from occurring. That's a horrible trade off to have to make. But yeah. that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make procreation okay. It just means that in this particular scenario, it's the least unethical choice. Yeah, if, if, even if I like grant all of that. Um, yes. Like the very phrasing of procreation would be the less of the two evils. Yes. The fact that we even use the word procreation there seems like we're outside of the category of antinatalism. I, I don't think so, because you're still saying that procreation is an evil. By saying it's the two evils, you're still saying it's wrong to procreate. And that's my antinatalism. It's wrong to bring sentient beings into existence. I don't see how that violates antinatalism. You're just saying that if if your definition of antinatalism is antinatalism is always the worst option in all circumstances, then fair enough. I don't think you're going to have many consequentialist antinatalists. Well, I, I wouldn't even say that. Scale up the consequentialists. I, I wouldn't even say the worst. It would just be not procreation. That would just be it. So procreation is wrong in all circumstances. Not even not even right or wrong. It's just yeah. saying antinatalism by definition is like it's unethical to procreate. Hang on. Sorry, I, I maybe I'm not following it. So you're not saying right or wrong, but you're saying that it's unethical. To well, procreate. sorry, I, I meant some. No, no, I misspoke there. I was like, it's it. So when I think about the category of antinatalism, it's uh, it would be that it's. As soon as we say procreation, um, like there are selective environments where it'd be less wrong. Yes, like than, the David Pierce transhumanism. But I feel like na like natalists do this anyway. Like uh, under just like take away anti-natalist community and all that jazz. Yes, N like day to day normal people will say in uh, context A and context B, one is yes. less bad than the other. Um, then why have antinatalism, in my opinion? Like, well, I, I no, don't understand. Well, well now, I, I think why have antinatalism if you remove antinatalism from the context of, or you remove it from the harms of coming into existence. So I think that antinatalism is justified because of the, the real world that we live in, the harms of coming into existence, the very real harms that there are. If you do a David Pearson, remove them, then there's no point of being an antinatalist. Again, you can have this uh, you have this rule that it's always going to be wrong. It's always going to be the worst choice in all circumstances. Fine. But then I think you've removed antinatalists, uh, removed all consequentialists from uh, the antinatalist label. Mm. Because you're saying that in those in no scenario could the consequences of procreating be um, justified or even the correct option even if it doesn't cross the bar into becoming a, a good thing to do it could never be the better the, the, the lesser of two evils yeah. honestly I, I don't for me personally my personal view on this is that yeah what, why would you be an antinatalist in a world where there was no harm of it I wouldn't be an antinatalist. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But but so, see, like I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to push you on like um, this is my last, like um, I think like on one of the live streams, like uh, well, it wouldn't be anti. I'm like it, 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 if the argument is uh, that it would be ethical, then like I, I'm not, I'm not like steadfast on the label. Um, mm. 
but the thing is i would just wouldn't use the label like that i think that's more of like where we're like the differences is is like i could grant literally everything you've said but we're categorizing it differently and i don't know practically like how um so maybe i'm misunderstanding how you understand the label um i'm sorry i've talked a lot about how i personally understand antinatalism um but yeah maybe i could if you could explain a bit more about how you understand the antinatalist label i see like when people do uh like if i think about it like a category of people saying there are conditions where it would be um less harmful or more ethical of procreation i feel like we're outside of the domain of antinatalism that's all because now now we're just talking about selective reproduction or selective um procreation I mean, I, I can see that point, but I don't think one, I don't think that relates to the sperm donation example because someone else made a decision. Right? Yeah, yeah, you're not causing progression to happen. Um, I, I, so you, you're saying that once the decision has been made to procreate and you're deciding what form of procreation is less or more, you're not talking about antinatalism. Yeah. I do. So. I can see that point, but I could, I think someone could be an antinatalist and still say um, these are less or, you know, you can still say, I think that overall creating a being, bringing a being into existence is wrong, though I can recognize that doing it in this way is less wrong than doing it in that way. So, um, you know, Lawrence and I uh, uh, spoke with the famous pronatalists, Simon and Malcolm Collins. Yeah. And they have... Uh, selected the embryos specifically for traits that, uh, you know, like avoiding depression and this kind of thing. And I think that's wrong because they're bringing a whole bunch of people into existence, but they're explicitly looking to bring beings into existence who suffer less. And I'd say that's probably less, eth I think that's less unethical than um, just procreating and, and not going through that process. Yeah. I, do you, I don't think that means I'm not an antinatalist. Um, but I would say that, okay, antinatalism to one side, which of these two is less uh, morally problematic? And I'd say that what they're doing is less problematic than, say, what my parents did when they created me. The antinatalist card is hard because, like, when I was involved in the vegan world, mm. as you said, like, there's, like, <laughs> there's a joke about level five vegans and... yes. Like, yes. I think um, there's another meme of, like, who argues more with vegans, um, carnists or vegans, or vegans and vegans. And it's like, yes. <laughs> that's that's what I witnessed, is that a lot of the infighting, like, was, like, with other vegans not being vegan enough. Yes. Um, so and for that, me... That is, that is common in every ideological group. Yeah. You've got it in different religious denominations. Um, every political movement, they argue more amongst themselves than they do externally. So this is not... It's not our fault. The reason I think it's especially bad with antinatalism is that the label is all we've got. So, you know, the vegans can say, oh, you're not real vegan by my definition, etc." But at the end of the day, they can, you know, they'll eat at the same restaurant. Um, you know, they've got certain behaviors that people could identify them by and say, oh, you're a vegan and you're a vegan. Um, even if they might have an internal disagreement, we don't have that with antinatalism. And Don't. for me, like the card, like I'm not emotionally tied to the card. I don't, I don't, yeah. I'm not. But that emotional tie to the card seemed to be a big part of the, again, the objections to what I'd said was around the, this is not antinatalism. Not just from you, but I mean in general. It's like, this is not antinatalism. Mm. And, and, and not just it's not antinatalism. It's so obviously not antinatalism. And I'm like, well, maybe I'm just being stupid, but what am I missing? Well, I have a feeling when this is released, comments will be made. Um, do Probably. you want to like, make any? I feel like you've you haven't really said anything new in terms of your position. Like it's the same position. Yeah. Um, I, like, what's your goal, or like, what are what are some things that you would like as an outcome of this conversation? I guess. Well, to see if I've really missed something obvious would be the main one for me as an anti-atalist. I'd be like, okay, what, what what am I missing here? And judging by the uh, 
reaction and the the mockery and all this stuff it made it sound like i was missing something very obvious uh given the amount of mockery and outrage um which is what tends to happen when people say things ridiculous people either laugh or you know start tearing their hair out um so yeah i'd like to know what i'm missing for one um and also like to know how people think that we should uh how people how we should respond to this definition of disagreements within the community um now if someone came to an anti meet meetup and was actively uh you know getting ivf for their 10th kid i think someone could reasonably go are you sure you're an anti natalist like you know you're just planning on having all loads of kids into the future but beyond that i don't think we have much that you know to drive you know i'm not sure to what to drive people you know to say to remove people's antinatalist card over again i think that bringing choosing not to be a vegan and paying for thousands of sentient beings to come into existence is a far bigger uh wrong from an antinatalist perspective than the i can't even see any wrong potential small kind of signaling wrong of going and donating sperm as an antinatalist if someone knew you were an antinatalist and you went and donated sperm and told them that you did it then that might create some confusion but i can't apart from that i can't see any wrong in doing it well for the disagreement with, sorry, oh, sorry with all the caveats that i stressed the most right, right. important caveat being that no additional beings can brought into existence sorry mark i had to get that in um so you've brought this up to multiple people right yes and no one's like given a sufficient answer to you like as a counter well, not sufficient. I mean, they might think their counter arguments are solid, um, but, but genuinely, to like a mutual I th- understanding kind of thing. Well, there's not a there's not a counter argument that I've heard that I've that I'm thinking is quite good that I'm burying. If that makes sense, like genuinely, the best counter arguments for those who responded to the caveats, there were some that said, um, you know, within the antinatalist literature, donating your gametes your genetic material is seen as wrong. Fair enough. I I don't think it's justified, but, you know, fair enough. Well, there are some that say aesthetically something feels icky about donating sperm in a way that it doesn't when you go and buy your coffee. Fair enough. You know, aesthetically, I get that. But again, I'm not saying that I don't understand where people are coming from, but logically, is this something that can be based out into an argument, into a, you know, something that can be laid out as a convincing argument and the answer is i I think it's just no like i'm not it's it's not like i'm putting my foot down and saying no you know what i'm gonna throw my toys out the pram and be stubborn for the sake of it it's like genuinely what am i missing guys that's that's my response to this would you have like a conversation with like your co-host or because i assume you guys disagree and well, there's an element of like, there are bigger. Oh yeah, this is uh, <laughs> like I mean, how long yeah, do you want it to go uh, yeah. on for? Yeah, yeah. Like, if this was something that I was advocating, if I was like Lawrence, we need to put this on antinatalist advocacy activism page, is something that people should do, then that would be worth it. Right. Um, I know that Lawrence isn't planning on donating his vasectomy, and I'm getting a vasectomy soon, and I'm not planning on donating sperm before then. So this isn't something that either of us value particularly uh, maybe someone like Nomad of Omelas has a more compelling pro reason for doing this mm. um, with his comments before um, but yeah there are just many other things that we can be doing that yeah, yeah. hopefully don't get this huge emotional reaction like talking about sperm donation does and again totally get the emotional reaction if people are like what you said sounds like eugenics and you should never ever ever veer in ear comments that sound like eugenics i'll be like you know fair enough i can totally get that from like an aesthetic point of view don't be seen to be supporting eugenics um but it wasn't that it was like this is not part of antinatalism um but yeah i i if so if so, would i be open to talking about it again if someone had a really compelling counter argument maybe but even then there's an element of like uh okay you've convinced me i'm not going to do it I wasn't going to do it anyway. But there is maybe, you know, I would be open to having more conversations around how do we approach disagreement within the antinatalist community. That Yeah, that's where I wanted to move it to is like, well, yes. how would you like to see? Because um, uh, other than the 
public comments. Um, I don't know what it's like from your perspective uh, mm. of like what happened afterwards. Um, and like, so like one, like uh, w what was that like? But also like, what what would you like to see? Or like, um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the main, so the main feeling I had about it, which is self-inflicted, was that I dropped Lawrence in it somehow. Like, given the way that people were reacting, and this was on a, a platform that we are both on, that supposedly, you know, represents, not even represents our views that we both represent. Uh, I was a bit like, oh, no, I'm, you know, and, I, and that's what the addendum was. Like, I, it was an apology to Lawrence, essentially, to say that this was not the platform to bring this up on. Um, in terms of, but then I do think, afterwards to think well it started an interesting conversation about how we respond to this agreement within the anti-natalist community um because yeah I, I view this as an issue that's not all that again it's, it's just not important in and of itself but i do think that the reaction prompts interesting questions um what would i like to see more of um i guess there are two elements to a response to disagreement there's like the emotional response and then there are the arguments if this makes sense so like someone can make really good arguments but do it in a very kind of like hysterical way and then someone could make some bad arguments but you know behave very gentlemanly let's just say and we want to get to the point to a community i think where we have both where we can disagree well and we can disagree with good argumentation but I don't know how far away we are as a community to do that. Um, I'm not in many of the antinatalist spaces. I can only talk from my limited experience. Um, but sadly, uh, I don't see that, you know. I think that Amanda, because we had our panel, Antinatalist Advocacy, on, you know, problems within the community. Um, and then I interviewed Amanda, Amanda Sukunik, um, separately about the antinatalist community. And she said she brought up the disagreement as a, big problem within the community and i'd say that the disagreement is a problem but i i think a much bigger problem is our approach to disagreement like i don't i don't think the people holding different opinions is necessarily as problematic as a a bad culture around disagreement if that makes sense because if you have a good culture around disagreement then you can uh create a forum where you can hash stuff out but if you have a bad culture around disagreement then that's that's not great yeah i mean we're on the internet like i i don't know like, yeah sorry I, I'm, I'm putting <laughs> problems out there with no obvious solution like like if you like i actually so i so i used to be on antinatalist twitter and i tried mm. to get involved like i tried to um, pay more attention to the Reddit, but the vile stuff that I kept seeing was just mm. like, it was stressing me out. So I'm like, I'm not going to, um, like, I, I don't see this as, um, like, I, I, I'm not child free in theory, like I would adopt and that mm. alone would like a lot of people would say that that's bad. Um, and the whole vegan thing is like, that's a big, uh, like, bringing up animals in certain anti-natalist spaces just is not allowed. Um, yes. And so, like, and yeah. I, I'll even say that that might even be appropriate. You know, I, I obviously, you know, passionate vegan advocate, talk about it to the cows come home. Um, but I can see times and places where it's not appropriate to bring it up. Like I, we had a disagreement in a, a WhatsApp group for London anti-natalists where there was a, an ex-vegan there, somebody who wasn't vegan anymore, and their former friend uh, who was a very... Uh, you know, passionate vegan was saying, you know, this guy should be kicked out essentially. And we were like, no, no, this is an antinatalist space, not a vegan space. Um, so, you, yeah. know, so, you know, I, I do try and walk the walk as it comes to disagreement. Um, I think, and don't get me wrong, when I said that we don't have a positive atmosphere around disagreement, as I said about like other social groups or any, any kind of group that's brought together by an ideology, um, lots of them don't have a positive attitude around disagreement. 
vegan activist spaces often don't have a positive attitude around this agreement. That's what we were talking about before, Mark, with the vegans arguing against other vegans. The difference is there's a lot of other stuff that vegans have going for them and vegan spaces have going for them that we don't in the antinatalist community. So Which is why to, I think it's oh, even sorry. more important that we get this right. Sorry. So um, if I was to like hone in on the specifics of like uh, how you would like or like how, how disagreements, particularly in this context of what happened here. Um, mm. So it was like um, saying that you like revoking your antinatalist card. Um, yes. Was one of them. Was there anything else? Well, I think that, you know, uh, you know, I can take issue with certain stuff. I think there was some good funny stuff as well. So you, me and Jack were laughing about the um, the thought of antinatalists, you know, jacking it to save the future. And then people made jokes around that. I think that's quite, you know, it is a funny thought, like a bunch of antinatalists being like, I need to pass on my compassionate genes. Yeah. Um, so that was all good natured. Um, I think mostly the label stuff, because the label is all we've got. And I said this on the episode 10, you know, the criticisms panel with uh, Lenny and Conundrum. And that is that if you make the label unusable, then what do we have as a community? The, the label is the only thing that holds us together as a loosely held together community. Mm. If you say, you know, the, the argument that you don't represent my version of antinatalism, therefore you can't use the antinatalist label. Who could use it in that case? Like, how on earth could the label be used? Because your version of antinatalism is different than my version of antinatalism and so on and so forth. So that any... Sorry. Can you still hear me? Yeah. I knew it was going to happen. I balanced my microphone on these books rather than getting oh. this down because I'm a cheap bastard. Um, but the point is, like, anything that tries to use the antinatalist label, unless they boiled down to the lowest possible uh, common denominator, which would be something around not having additional children, unless they boil down to that, and again, people would still find stuff to nitpick over about, you know, God knows what, uh, then w you run the risk if you use the antinatalist label of offending someone, and then they're going to turn around and say, that's not my version of antinatalism. And if if we if we say that's the standard, you know, that's how we approach this agreement is that if you have a different version of antinatalism um, than me, then you're not allowed to use the label. Then I think we're done for as a community, quite frankly, because the, the, the label is all we've got. It's the only thing that holds us together. And if we can't figure out how to accommodate different understandings of it, then the label's useless as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think I'm like for me personally, I'm I'm like the reverse of of that, where it's like uh I'm I'm it's not that I'm more than willing to abandon the label. I actually think that I won't use the label anymore. Mm. Um just because of all these uh disagreements. I'm like, well, if if the majority of antinatalists have this conception then I don't have to be an antinatalist while no, holding is my true. own beliefs of like, you know, not creating someone. And yes, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and, and, and as a, you know, as a vegan in particular, where people care about the actions more than the label. Yeah, like, exactly. The vegan thing is a perfect example because yes. a lot of people ask me to like, are you vegan? And they're like, they push me and I'm like, knowing for so many years, how many like, you know, people that won't give you the card i'm like i don't have to yeah. i don't have to i don't even have to say it sometimes yes. i was like i'm an anti-speciesist or i'm an, and like there was different ways of i'm um sentios what is it there was there were there were different terminologies reductionarianism yes. and and there was so many different new terms coming out where um because this was a problem i think back a couple of years ago um, yes. Or a few years ago, like, I'm talking about like five, six years ago, where people were making new, which in essence were the exact same thing as yes, veganism. Yes, they were veganism by another name. Yeah, yes. yeah. And that's kind of what I feel like um, may happen. Well, I don't I don't know what's going to happen in AN spheres, but I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't need to use the label. So I'm absolutely I'm in it. And I think that's totally fine as an individual. If you're not causing the harm, if you're not bringing the beings into existence, or if you're not eating the animals in the vegan context, then it's like, 
you know, who cares? Just leave people alone. <laughs> but the, the thing is, I do think it is important if you're trying to build someone, uh, sorry, build something. As we're trying to do with antinatalists. I was just going to say, like, you have more, community. Yeah. you have more of um, an incentive to use it because you're trying to build something. I'm not, right? Absolutely. And that's my yeah. worry about it is like, how? Like, and this is what we tried to get across in the criticisms panel to uh, Lenny and Conundrum is the purpose behind antinatalist advocacy is to make something by and for antinatalists. So if we take antinatalism out of the label and our what we mention and all this kind of stuff, then we've we've failed at step one. We haven't made something for antinatalists. Now it's not to say that antinatalists can't use something which is connected to antinatalism or something like that. But I do think that, especially with what we were trying to do with antinatalist advocacy when we set it up, like we we identified a need or a, not even a, if not a need like a niche, um, something that we could try and provide. That like we thought would be a stuff or no with the antinatalism stuff. So and again, it's all in episode 10, but I do think that antinatalists have uh several advantages, potentially have several advantages, as it doesn't apply to everyone who uses the label, uh, when it comes to doing good in the world, you know. Um, what I would consider to be a realistic view of life, you know, not being a fanatical life lover. Um some norms among some antinatalists of making sacrifices to follow your label, whether that's not having children if you want to have them or um, so not fo not follow the label. I mean, say follow your ethics related to the label. Sorry. So not having children or not eating animals. Um, and also the fact that you don't have children, more time and money to do good in the world, potentially. Um, so I do think that those three things, you know, the, more realistic view of the world how i would you know my how i would view a realistic view of the world uh, some norms around making personal sacrifices within the community and more resource to do good i think that antinatalists have um a really important or could you know could have a, a really important role to play in lots of pressing social issues which is why we set up antinatalist advocacy and identify those cause areas so antinatalist advocacy is like trying to help the antinatalist community, not necessarily be an organization to advocate for antinatalism, right? So it's a secondary aim of what we do. And, and this is something that we struggled a bit with, with the, with the label. So it was a bit like, you know, the, the, what do we go for? Antinatalist activism, antinatalist something platform. And it's like, oh, that kind of suck. Antinatalist advocacy, I thought was like, it's got a nice ring to it, you know, a nice bit of alliteration. Um, and it is a secondary aim. So the primary aim is around supporting antinatalists to follow an impact driven approach to doing good, you know, donate money, planning your career. We've got this five steps guide that's coming out soon. Um, you know, the five steps to doing good as an antinatalist, supporting people to take those five steps. Mm -hmm. And then as a secondary aim of that, a secondary aim of antinatalists going out there and engaging with the world and trying to do good, uh, then the antinatalist message, if you like, will spread, hopefully. But again, that's not our primary aim. Our primary aim isn't to make more antinatalists. It was to help it. antinatalists who want to do good, do good. Okay. Because I think in one of the episodes, you said like it would be more effective to target um, non-vegans, right? Um, well, from a purely suffering, yes. Yeah, so this was a, ironically a controversial uh, comment that I'd made that seemed to get at the opposite. I was going to say, did you get a lot of comments eugenics. about that? Uh, no, okay. I mean, no, not a lot of comments. I mean, not people. I mean, we got we got negative backlash, a bit of negative backlash to our episode on, um, but again, a minor negative backlash. It's just like you can tell like the like to dislike ratio and the like to dislike ratio for the why we should not eat animals episode um because we have animal agriculture as one of our cause areas that had like a 80 percent like to dislike ratio where the others has been much closer to 100 mm -hmm. um but again like 80 percent it's not it's not backlash i don't want to be playing the victim here or anything and even with this whole uh you know uh, sperm comments thing. I don't want to play, act like it was like a, a, a witch hunt or anything like that. It was a few comments online. Um, but I do think, uh, so I didn't get any comments for that. So that this was specifically on 
who we as antinatalists would target our antinatalist message to. And depending on why you're an antinatalist, if you are a suffering, if you're concerned about suffering as a reason for being an antinatalist, and especially if you subscribe to some of the misanthropic arguments for being an antinatalist, then it would make sense to not target your activism towards groups that cause significantly less suffering, if this makes sense. And this again gets to the Peter Singer argument about how he's concerned that people who do act ethically and are concerned about the long term future, that they don't have children. And it's not even because he's not getting a, it's not just the genetic point there. It's just like there'll be fewer people who are willing to act ethically in the future. Um, so if, if we're starting out as antinatalist advocates and we have to think of who to target, it doesn't make, and if you're concerned about suffering, it would make more sense to me to go for. Uh, well, not even to to specifically go for, but it wouldn't. It's the opposite, really. It's saying don't target vegans was the point that I was making. If you're concerned about suffering, um, or even if you're an antinatalist and you see all these being people bring bringing lots of beings into existence, you're bringing lots of uh, sentient beings into existence. Why would you target the group that brings thousands fewer sentient beings into existence? If that makes sense. And and is that like um an AA community building thing or? Well, we don't do anti, well, there's the thing is that because we're not going out there necessarily to preach our good antinatalist message. So me and Lawrence have been speakers corner and held up signs, but that's on his YouTube channel. Um, if we were going out there to preach antinatalism, I think it wouldn't be a good idea to do it in the vegan community. No, because we have to think, the thing is we have, we have to think strategically. We are such a small community that, uh, our message is only going to get to a few people for the foreseeable future. So I do think it is worth pausing and reflecting on how we approach activism or spreading the message or however you want to term it. And so this the point is to say that rather than target vegans as a lower hanging fruit, if you like, as a as a as a group, um, might it make more sense to target those groups that bring way more sentient beings into existence? So this is unrelated to a lot of, maybe it's related. It's just popped in my head while you're saying this. So if you don't mind, um, cause, cause you're bringing in the effective altruism model into antinatalism, but understanding yes. that this is going to, um, like it's a very tiny community and you're going to convince a small amount of people. It yes. doesn't feel effective. Like, I feel like I would be more effective doing animal activism than antinatalism stuff. Yeah, I think if your approach to uh, – it depends on what your approach is. So for one thing, and what we did with the cause areas was to say that um, there are things that – you know, there are social causes which do align with antinatalism, or at least my understanding with antinatalism, which we could be supporting. So, for example, if we park veganism to one side because we talked about it a lot, uh, if you look at something like reducing childhood mortality, um, because the evidence shows that if you reduce childhood mortality, the birth rate goes down, as well as avoiding all the suffering of dying in childhood, of easily preventable deaths. So for, if for whatever reason you're an antinatalist, if you're an antinatalist because of um, reducing suffering purposes, like reducing childhood mortality seems like a good thing to do. Um, and if you're an antinatalist because of, uh, you know, just the number of beings being brought into existence this seems to do that so if that's something that you want to do then you know these are the like we've just recently revamped our page on um related to humans to to, to factor that in I, I, re I feel like that was a ramble that didn't answer your questions sorry I, I'm still a little bit confused like if if I um if I have a choice of like what I'm going to do Mm. Uh, and I want to be effective at producing, like if I, I want to be effective with my energy, time, and resources. Yes. Uh, why would I choose antinatalism compared to animal causes? No, no, I totally agree. And this is oh, what okay. we've said, is that we've got these cause areas that are laid out. These are social issues that people are already concerned about. Okay. And what we're saying is, hey, antinatalists, if you want to do good, there's this promising opportunity over here to go and do it. That makes sense. We're not saying go out and spread the antinatalist message, but that will happen as a nice byproduct potentially of you doing good and being engaging with the world. Hmm. Do you think like it's because like 
I wouldn't like I don't even know how effective it would be to target antinatalists that are not vegan. I feel like I would mm. just do regular uh I don't know what to call like I don't even know if that's a proper term, regular vegan outreach, but you know, no, the, no, tradi fair. the traditional I mean, kind of thing. If you're thinking about it this way, if <laughs> Again, to go back to Peter Singer's comments, the influence of what you're brought up eating might play a role in your attitudes towards animals. So if antinatalists are non-vegan, they're not having any children, uh, they're not influencing the next generation in the way that non-vegan parents might be. So maybe you should go and target the parents. Again, this is the kind of thing that difficult consequentialist thinking that comes in when you're trying to think about impact. Um, this stuff is hard. But what what draws you to the antinatalist stuff? Because like consequentially, it seems like you're targeting like a tiny little niche on the yes. internet. Yeah. Well, targeting a small niche, yes, but I do think that antinatalists, for the reasons that I said earlier, the three reasons I said earlier, I do think that antinatalists have um a lot of potential. And I see this as a you know, like a growing community. I think a lot of people will a lot of people are choosing not to have children for whatever reason, you know, birth rates are plummeting. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of like and, and also we know that birth rates, changes of mindset often follow changes of behavior. So someone's decided not to have children, they're going to be more open to the antinatalist message, if that makes sense. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so in th we should, in theory, expect the antinatalist community to grow as fewer people are having children. Um, and... While there's a lot of philosophical discussion and talk about right and wrong within the antinatalist community, Lawrence and I saw there was a bit of a niche to support people to to actually do good, to do you know practical ethics and put stuff into practice, which is why we decided to target it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I th th thank you for. Um, I, I feel like I don't I don't know if that part was like connected to our original <laughs> topic. But, no, no, I'm um, more than happy to answer. Thanks for entertaining um, some of that. Was there anything, because we're getting close to the two hour mark, sure. was there anything that you like wanted to add or clarify or, or hash out uh, or, or no. comments that you want to make in, in preparation for anybody who's going to be reacting and so forth? No, fair enough. Uh, well, first of all, again, just a huge thank you for having me on, Mark. Um, I really do appreciate the, uh, invite. I think it came a couple of months ago, and we've had a, you know, a bit of delay, a couple of delays on both of our ends uh, before we've been able to get on. So I really do appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know, for I coming on, and I'm glad that, uh, yeah. I, Sorry I for hope the scheduling conflicts. No, 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 no worries. I was going to say, I, I hope that people don't feel that I'm being intentionally uncharitable. Like I might be being uncharitable to people who disagree with me on the sperm bank stuff, but I'm not intentionally. Like one of the reasons I don't like formal debates is because they encourage you to to be uncharitable towards your opponent's arguments and dismiss them and do lots of theater and why would someone say that kind of nonsense rather than uh, like engage with them. So I promise that's not what I'm doing here. I'm not just trying to be dismissive and be like, how could you say something so stupid? Um, so yeah, if I really am missing something on the sperm bank stuff, again, don't worry, I'm not going to go out and donate sperm tomorrow. But it still would be good to know what I'm missing because when I've talked about this to people, they haven't been able to point it out. And it, and that doesn't mean that I'm some genius. And, and as you said, Mark, I don't feel like I've shared anything here. Maybe the uh, argument, the Will McCaskill argument about changing identity. Right, the identity stuff, yeah, yeah. But the fundamental point about no more beings being brought into existence was in the original comments and reiterated in the caveats. So it's a bit like, like what am I missing? I, I generally do want to know what I'm missing. Um, yeah, so if I please do let me know what I am missing. It'd be great to hear people's thoughts on, the, you know, what I had to say about disagreement in the antinatalist community. Um, Is there a way people can contact you without like the comment section or? Um. To be fair, I think if they're, if they're watching this, I'll, I'll I'll put my like I'll leave a comment under the video, and then people can reply to there or something okay. like that. I think that might be the best way to do it, um, rather than going through antinatalist advocacy or anything like that. But yeah, I really do appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'd like to thank anyone who's made it to the end of the video. As you said, <laughs> we've been recording for nearly two hours. <laughs> um, how do you feel it went? Oh, I was. No, I, I like to ask, like, while we're recording, just like, oh, how sure. people, because, like, 
I, I don't like when people like get interviewed or something like that. And they're like, I wish I said this. I wish. Oh, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And I just want to like make sure we end like everything is, you know. Uh, no, no. I, I mean, really grateful. I mean, I'm not the clearest of thinkers or speakers, so I tend to ramble quite a bit. Um, but I, that, that is the one advantage of the delays is that we did have the chance to send each other you know what we wanted to cover and sources and this kind of thing and i think that's just a um you know without blowing our trumpets i do think that's a good way to have discussions um i hate it in the debate when someone brings up a source without someone giving the without giving someone the chance to respond to it i think it's so dishonest um but it happens quite a lot so having a lot of time to really hash out what we were going to cover and you know what the arguments were i really did appreciate that um so yeah Really, really, really grateful to come on. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you again for coming on, and um, all all the best and good luck to for your future endeavors. And uh, right. yeah, I'll I'll end it now. Thanks. Take bro. care. And.